Well, we have been very blessed here at Nodford Church over recent years. We have been able to see many, many, many people come to faith. They have been drawn into the church for various reasons, from many different backgrounds, and have sat under the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit has been so gracious to us here, and he has worked in great power, and the Gospel has transformed many lives in our midst. It's been an amazing few years, and I feel very fortunate to have been pastor here at Norfa through this time of blessing, and I also feel that we have only just begun the good work. Many of the testimonies that we have celebrated here at Nodfa Church are common to the West. It is the I was, but Christ, now I am conversion story. I was a drug addict, I was a pub fighter, I was depressed and suicidal, but Christ, now I am clean, now I am on the straight and narrow and building my life again. All very beautiful stories of hope, all evidence of God's hand at work, all valid in their own right and all of them proof of the social mobility that does come with the Gospel in the West. I was, but Christ, now I am. I was, but Christ, now I am. That is the conversion story we've seen time and time again here at Monfa, and one that is common to the Western Church. But sadly, this story is exclusive to us in the West, and it is incredibly uncommon from a global perspective. In the Middle East, Africa and much of Asia, as well as in countries that are oppressed and under communist or atheist regimes, the Christian testimony is in fact the very opposite. It begins with, I was a successful businessman, I was a school teacher, I was an accountant or a police officer. I had a lovely home and a beautiful wife and, and children. But Christ, now I am unemployed. Now I am homeless. My wife assaulted before my eyes. My eldest son crucified because of my faith. My daughter has been kidnapped. This is the sad reality of most Christians in the world. And what amazes me is that despite their suffering, despite their risk to life for declaring that Jesus is Lord, their churches are booming. In 1979, there were an estimated 500 Muslims to Christian converts in Iran, each one of them risking their lives for their faith. The church in Iran has survived three decades of oppressive regimes who have endlessly persecuted the people there, murdering them for their faith. As a result, today, there are now estimated over one million Muslim to Christian converts in Iran. Isn't that amazing? In China, where they are tearing down churches, and arresting Christians and beating them up and putting them into prison and uh, into forced labour camps. Just in the last decade, the church, I'm speaking just the Protestant church here, has doubled to about 50 million people in China. 50 million people. That's about the population of England. All of them Christians, solid Christians, tested, proven Christians. Imagine that, 50 million. And you see the same across Islamic Asia and Africa. In the West, people have everything to gain 
by becoming a Christian. And we can't even get them to come into church to worship their God. Elsewhere, they have everything to lose by coming to church. Yet, they are running in. We have a lot to learn here in Wales. We have a lot to think about here in the West. Does the church in Wales have it too easy? Are we complacent? Will we continue to stand when things get tougher here in Wales for Christians? We have begun to study the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Last week we began with Ephesus. This week we are now in the church in Smyrna. Smyrna is 60 kilometres north of Ephesus. It is another large affluent city with a big harbour and lots of trade. Smyrna was famed for its loyalty to Rome. The Christians there were clearly having a rough time of it. They stood for love and truth over commerce. And this was not good when surrounded by the affluence of their city. And it would seem that they had also lost their protected status as Jews. You see, owing to the temple tax uh, that went back to Rome, Jews across the whole empire were given relative freedom uh, to carry on worshipping their God as they desired in their synagogues. But it appears from this letter to the church in Smyrna that the local synagogue did not offer this protection to the Messianic Jews. Uh, Jews who believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah. They were thus ostracised from their local Jewish community. Uh, so to Rome, these Messianic Jews or Christians were nothing more than a cult. A cult who would not bow the knee to Caesar. This would obviously lead to great suffering for them and imprisonment and even death at the hands of the Roman Empire. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12 that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I'll repeat that verse because it is very important. 2 Timothy 3.12 Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecution is a reality of the Christian walk and we see it right here in Smyrna as it is today all over the world. Christians are currently the most persecuted people group in the world. There has been 900,000 martyrs that we know of in the last 10 years but not a mention in the news for it. And we, as a church in Wales, we need to ask ourselves, why? Why are we not facing the same difficulties? In light of 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why are we, as a church in Wales, not facing such difficulties? And I do not ask this question in an attempt to wish uh, such a horrendous ordeal onto us. But there is a challenge there, isn't there? It causes us to question, are we as a church indeed living godly lives? Are we taking Jesus and his church seriously enough? Are we even a threat to our godless society anymore? These are tough questions that we need to ask ourselves as a church and wake up to. 
The Bible tells us that persecution is a reality for the Christian walk. And Jesus warns us of this truth right from the beginning of his ministry. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says in Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In John 15.18, he says, The world hates you, but remember that it hated me first. And then in verse 20, when the world persecutes you, remember it persecuted me first. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And in these words of Jesus lay the hope of this message here for the church in Smyrna. It is that Jesus has the victory. So look to him when you are suffering for your faith and you will always, always have hope. Look to him, the one who is victorious in your persecution, in your doubts, in your fears, and you will have a crown of life. Friends, it is when we are weak that Christ is with us all the more. Isn't that good news? For his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And it is in our weakness that we are exalted with him, as it says in Philippians 2. So we must never give up the fight. Friends, we as a church today, we can take a lot from this letter. Are we being too safe as Christians? Are we hiding our lamp under a bushel? Are we taking enough risks to share God's love to a broken world? Are we fighting the good fight of faith from Christ's victory for God's kingdom? And if you believe we are, then ask yourself, why are we not facing the persecution that our brothers and sisters around the world are facing for what they believe in. Friends, as a church, we desperately need to pray. Post-Covid life is going to get harder and it is always the minorities who are going to get it in the neck when things get difficult for the masses. And for the first time in a millennia, we Christians are a minority in Wales. Things are going to get difficult. So I want you to ask yourselves today, will you be able to stand? Over the coming years, the government is going to have to begin austerity like we have never seen before. And they're going to capitalise on the church's principles of service to the community. Our food banks and other services, they're going to be stretched thin, possibly to breaking point. Many of our members as a church are having to isolate because of this virus. And we need to pray that they will come back stronger to support the ranks as we fight the good fight of faith in this new post-Covid world. We know that when Peter followed Christ from a distance, he ended up denying him. And I don't want this to happen to any of our church family who are isolating. We need to pray for them. Friends, I thank God for strengthening the church at Nolfa in time for this pandemic. But we have a rocky road ahead of us post-COVID-19. But we must take heart and hear what the Spirit says to the churches and keep on keeping on. We must persevere, we must fight, fight the good fight of faith and share in Christ's victory. 
We must use any suffering that is coming our way to our advantage. We must let it challenge us and refine us and make us stronger for the task ahead. Let's use it to bring us closer to Jesus, closer to the foot of his cross. Join me with prayer this week to say, Lord, give us strength to be faithful even unto a point of death so that we can gain the victor's crown in heaven. Friends, I will leave you with the words of the Apostle Peter, who had to learn these truths the hard way after his denial of Christ. He said in 1 Peter 4, verse 12 onwards, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you, that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Jesus Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good.